We began our study of Luke about two and a half years ago, I think. And we have made it to chapter 22, looking at every verse, so we don't miss anything. Today's passage is going to be very short, only three verses. Uh, We're in the middle of the Last Supper. Last week we looked where uh, Jesus instituted the the Lord's Supper, Communion. And while they're sitting at the table, speaking, Jesus says this in verse 21. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, verse 21. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly, the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to question among themselves, which of them it was who would do this thing? Jesus is sitting at the table with his disciples, and out of nowhere he drops this bomb on them. He says in verse 21, the hand of my betrayer is at the table here with me. How many people were sitting at the table with him? Twelve. And he says, one of you here sitting at the table with me is going to betray me. The, the, disciples, the disciples have known that the Jews hated him. He knew that the religious leaders, they knew that the religious leaders hated him, wanted to have him killed. They knew that. But what they didn't know is that one of their own was going to betray Jesus to them. And so, Jesus, of course, who knew that Judas was going to betray him from the moment he picked him, uh, he's not surprised. He knows what's going on. But they're shocked. They're shocked at the statement. In verse 23, we're not going to ignore verse 22. We'll get there. In verse 23, they all began to question among themselves which of them was going to do this. And it's, in Luke, it's such a small passage. It's only three verses where he says, one of you is going to betray me. It's very interesting to take all four Gospels and line them up and get all the information you can and see how that played out. Where Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. And then you have 11 men, 11 honest men, who are shocked and terrified that it could be them. They know their hearts. They know that, they're, uh, that they could sin, they're afraid that they may in a moment of weakness betray their Lord and they're terrified and they're asking, is it me? Is it me? And Judas kind of sitting there, he doesn't want to seem like, uh, well I'm the only one not asking the question so he says, what, is it me? Is it that? Am I going to do anything? And uh, in the Gospel of John it's pretty interesting, you have uh, John is sitting next to Jesus and Peter is like somewhere further away and he kind of looks at John and says it is. So John leans in and asks him, and Jesus basically says, you know, the guy who dips his everything, you know. You know the story. So I guess John knew. And there's much we could talk about here, how the fact, the, the fact that the other 11 disciples had no clue that it was Judas. Uh, he had fooled them all. But um, what I want to do today is I really want to park on verse 22. And because there are some huge theological thoughts here that we need to grasp. We need to try and grasp what Jesus says in verse 22. So here we go. Verse 22. He says, And truly, the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. The Son of Man is Jesus. He says, The Son of Man goes as it has been determined. Determined by who? For whom? By God. God is the one who determined that Christ would come into the world, be betrayed, be crucified, die for the sins of his people. God is the one who has determined that this will all come to pass. Before the foundation of the world. That's why in the the book of Revelation, Jesus is called the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. In God's mind, it's not even a question. This is a done deal. It's going to happen. So as soon as you say, well, this was all planned out by God, the first question that may come to your mind is, well, then, it's not Judas' fault. Judas didn't do anything wrong. If God planned it, then 
Jesus isn't accountable for it. Right? I'm just, I'm just a, a robot. I'm just a, you know, I'm just a puppet in the play. God, God had already decreed that all this would happen. God had already decreed that Judas would betray him so that he would go to the cross. Judas didn't do anything wrong. And in case you have that thought, Jesus immediately, in the middle of verse 22, says, But, but, woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Woe is a judgment. So here we have, even though God has decreed, has determined the events that will lead to Christ's death, yet, at the same time, Judas is guilty and condemned for betraying him. That's what it says. We have in this one verse, you have the sovereignty of God in determining events, and at the same time, you have the responsibility of man. And the Bible teaches both of these things repeatedly. I would like to read you some verses before we move on. I'd like to read you some verses, first about the sovereignty of God, and then about the responsibility of man. And I want you to pay close attention to these, to these words. You don't have to go there because I have a bunch of verses here. Then we're going to look at some other passages together. Concerning the sovereignty of God. Is this something that the Bible teaches in general? Does, does the Bible in fact teach that God decrees and determines and predestines all things? Psalm 135 says, Whatever the Lord pleases, He does. In heaven and in earth, in the seas and all the deep places. Whatever He wants, He does. That's God. Isaiah 46, God speaks and he says, My counsel, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Indeed, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. God says, I want things to be done this way and I make it happen. Psalm 33 says, Let all the earth... Fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. For He spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples of no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of His heart to all generations. How about this one? One last one. Daniel chapter 4. And we could go on. But Daniel chapter 4, speaking of God, it says this. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? And we could go on. Ephesians chapter 1. God does all things according to the good pleasure of his own will. We could just keep on going. On and on. God does what he pleases with his good and holy will. He doesn't have to ask permission from anyone. He is the creator and he does what he wants with his creation. He is the potter and he does what he wants with the clay. Now, before you say, well, then I guess nothing really matters. You just just robots and just God does what he wants and we're just we don't nothing matters what we do it's not true because the Bible also teaches all the time that we are responsible for our actions that what we do does matter our actions have consequences 1 John chapter 1 if we confess our sins he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins if we confess our sins in other words, if you don't confess your sins, he won't forgive you. Um, Galatians chapter 6. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Your actions have consequences. It does matter what you do. Ezekiel 18. The soul that sins, it shall die. What did God say to Adam and Eve in the beginning? He said, if you eat of this, you will die. They ate and they died. What we do matters. We are accountable for 
for our actions. You see, so what happens here is you have the Bible teaches that God is totally sovereign, in control, rules over all things, predestines all things, and yet, yet, somehow, in His wisdom, He makes sure that our actions, we are still responsible for our actions. Now, sadly, sadly, most people who confess to be Christians do not believe this. Don't believe any of this. They, what they do is, they pick a side. They say, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. Therefore, I'm going to pick a side. And depending on which side they like the most, they go with that one. Some people say, we see all the passages that talk about the sovereignty of God, that He decrees all things. We believe that. And so, therefore, nothing we do matters. So it doesn't matter what you do. Whether you sin or not, who cares? It doesn't matter. It's been decreed by God. You know, you don't have to preach the gospel to anyone. Who cares? If God is going to save someone, you'll save them. We don't have to send missionaries to the other side of the world. If God is going to save someone, you'll save them. We don't have to do anything. That's their attitude. And then you have the other extreme, on the other side, people who say, no, 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 God hasn't decreed anything. God hasn't predestinated anything. Uh, we're responsible for what happens, so it's all up to us. It's all up to us. Whatever we do, it, it, if I don't uh, uh, witness correctly, if I don't say the right words, then people won't get saved. It depends upon me. If I don't, things right, uh, don't do things right, things will fall apart. Uh, you know, because God hasn't agreed to anything, it all depends upon me. I, am the, I decide my destiny. And the problem is, you can't pick and choose like that. You can't just say, well... I'm going to take half of the Bible and I'm going to believe that. Or the other half of the Bible and believe that. You have to take the Bible as a whole. I, I had a friend. I was discussing this with once. He claims to be a Christian. I am pretty sure he's not. And he said to me, I explained this to him. I said, the Bible teaches both. And he said to me, if that's true... Then, if, if I found that the Bible actually taught what you're saying, I would stop calling myself a Christian, and I would stop believing the Bible and find a different religion, because that doesn't make sense. Okay? And I thought to myself, wow, here, here's a guy who has not submitted to the, to the Word of God. Here's not someone who says, the Bible is my ultimate authority, Rather, he is saying, what I think is the ultimate authority, whatever makes sense to my small, puny, tiny mind, that is my ultimate authority. And if for some reason the Bible says something that I cannot comprehend, the Bible has got to be wrong. That's his position. Look, we are trying to understand the mind of God. Things are going to be difficult sometimes. But we cannot deny half the Bible because we don't understand how it works. Do you believe in the Trinity? Can someone explain that to me really well? Because I could have some questions how that works. That's what it says. And so what I want to do today, I want to look at some passages. Because we looked at a list of, I, I, I read a list of verses that talk about sovereignty of God and a list of verses that talk about man's responsibility. And we could just go on forever on both sides. But I want to show you some passages that within the, just like Luke 22 here, that in one sentence, in one breath, you have both these truths presented at the same time. And the person who said it just moves on, like, matter of fact. So, let me show you just a few verses. Please go to Acts chapter 4. We looked at this not too long ago, but let me just remind you. Acts chapter 4. Really quick, the context, Peter and John have, excuse me, Peter and John have healed a man in the name of Christ. They get arrested. As soon as they're arrested, they're, they're told by the Jewish leaders not to preach in the name of Christ. They say, sorry, we've got to do what God tells us rather than what men tell us. So but they're, they're let go. And then Peter and John go back to the church and they tell them what happened. And all the church together, praise to God that God would give them strength 
to go out and preach the gospel. And in that prayer of the early church, they say these words. Look at verse 27. Acts chapter 4, verse 27. For truly, against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together, verse 28, to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. You have four groups of people that are spoken of. You've got Herod, you've got Pontius Pilate, you've got the Jews and the Gentiles. All of them together conspire to kill Christ. Each one of them has their own motive. Herod didn't have the same motive as Pontius Pilate did. The Jews didn't have the same motives in killing Jesus as the Gentiles did. Each one has their own evil motive, evil motive for killing Jesus. And yet, all that was going on in, in, in the uh, killing of Jesus was according to God's hand, was being done by God's hand according to his purpose, which was predetermined. That's what it says. Let me show you an even clearer verse than that. Just take a, go a couple of pages behind, back to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, you know the context, it's the day of Pentecost. And Peter stands up to preach, and he says this in verse 22. Acts 2, verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. You, listening to me right now, with lawless hands, evil, wicked hands, what you did was evil. He's not saying it doesn't matter, that what, doesn't matter you're, you're, you're innocent. He doesn't say that. What you did with evil, lawless hands had been predetermined by God to happen. You're still guilty for what you did. But it was all according to God's plan to save his people. Let me show you a passage that's really going to blow your mind. Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah chapter 10. I'll give you the background really quick. Isaiah lived in the 8th century BC. And at that time, Israel was, well, often, uh, Israel falling into great sin and great idolatry. And so, God decided to send the Assyrians to come and destroy Israel. Okay? Hear these words. God sent Assyria to destroy Israel for their sins. Alright? And here in Isaiah chapter 10, it is a condemnation of Assyria for attacking Israel because what they did, they did with an evil intent and not for the glory of God. Read the passage with me. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 5. Woe, there's judgment again. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger and the staff in, in whose hand is my indignation. I will send him, the Assyrian, I will send him against an ungodly nation. That's Israel. I will send him against an ungodly nation and against the people of my wrath. I will, I will give him charge to seize the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Notice God is saying, I am sending them. I will give them the power to do this. Right? And yet, in the beginning, he said, woe to them. Why? Why woe? What did they do? Verse 7. Yet, he, the Assyrian, yet he does not mean so. Nor does his heart think so. But it is in his heart to destroy and to cut off not a few nations. 
For he says, Are not my princes altogether kings? Is not Kalno like Carchemish? Is not Hamath like Arpad? Is not Samaria like Damascus? As my hand has found the kingdoms of the idols, whose carved images excelled those of Jerusalem and Samaria, as I have done to Samaria and her idols, so I shall also do to Jerusalem and her idols. He says, Here's why Assyria, Assyria is guilty. Because what he is doing, he's not doing it to fulfill the will of God. He's not doing it because he wants to be obedient to God and fulfill his purposes. The Assyrian is doing it because it is in his heart to destroy. He wants to destroy a bunch of nations, and he says, I'm going to destroy Jerusalem just, I just, just like I destroyed all these other nations. No problem. I have the power to do it. Look at verse 12. Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Lord has performed all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, when the Lord... <laughs> has performed all his work, the judgment that's coming, on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, then he will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria, and the glory of his haughty looks. For he says, by the strength of my hand I have done it, and by my wisdom, for I am prudent. Also, I have removed the boundaries of the people and have robbed their treasuries. So I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. My hand has found like a nest the riches of the people. And as one gathers eggs that are left, I have gathered all the earth. And there was no one who moved his wing nor opened his mouth with even a peep. This is not what God has done. This is what I have done, says the Assyrian. I did whatever I want to do because I'm strong, I'm wise, I'm great. Completely disregarding the plans of God. And so, verse 15, look at this, verse 15. Shall the axe boast itself against him who chops with it? Who's the one chopping? God. Who's the axe? Assyria. Shall the axe boast itself against the one who chops with it? Or shall the saw exalt itself against him who saws with it? As if a rod could wield itself against those who lift it up. Or as if a staff could lift up as if it were not wood. Therefore the Lord, the Lord of hosts, will send leanness among his fat ones. And under his glory he will kindle a burning like the burning of a fire. God has a purpose and it was to destroy Israel by means of Assyria. Yet, he is perfectly just to punish Assyria for the evil intents of their heart. Just like with Judas. It was God's plan to have Jesus die on the cross. But Judas was not doing it because, well, I just want people to get saved. I want Jesus to die on the cross to pay for the sins of the world. No. He was doing it to get 30 pieces of silver. He had an evil intent. And therefore, he's guilty. Let me show you one last one. Uh, you could go to the book of Genesis in chapter 50. It's the end of the story of Joseph. Um, it's a very famous passage, but I'm not sure how much all of you know. So let me, let me just... I'm not going to give you the whole story of Joseph. That would take a while. It's like 14 chapters. And I'm going to try and shrink those 14 chapters into 5 minutes so I can give you the background so we can get to chapter 50. Really quick, the story of Joseph. Here we go. Jacob had 12 sons. The 11th son was Joseph. And Joseph was his favorite. Bad idea. Parents, if you have kids, don't have ones that are favorite. Because they favored one... Because, I'm sorry, because he favored the one, the other brothers hated him. Secondly, because he favored him, he gave him this coat that was very fancy, full of fancy colors. And so, uh, all the brothers hated him even more. And then Joseph also had dreams. Joseph had dreams like, um, you know, I was in the field and uh, gathering wheat. And my, I had my sheave of wheat. And then 11 sheaves of wheat would come and bow down to mine, implying that the other 11 brothers are going to come and bow down to him. And he was a teenager, and he would go and he would tell his brothers about this. And so they were like, hated him even more. So what happens one day, um, they're in the field watching the flock, and Joseph goes to find them. And they see him afar off, probably could tell it was him because of all the, the fancy coat, and they say, there's that dreamer, let's kill him. Let's just get rid of him once and for all. 
So they grab him, they throw him in a pit. After a while they say, you know what? I'm not going to make any money like this. Might as well try and sell him into slavery and get something out of it. And so there were some Ishmaelites going by and they sell their brother into slavery. And he is taken into Egypt as a slave. What they do, they take his coat and they cover it with animal's blood and they take it back to their father and they say, oh my goodness, Get, look what happened to Joseph and Jacob mourns for his son who he thinks has been killed by an animal. Now, we're going to run through the next few chapters. Joseph is in Egypt. Um, he is a slave at a, at a, a rich man's house. Uh, he gets... Uh, accused of a crime he did not commit, he gets framed, he, he's get, he gets thrown into jail. Uh, in jail, he's in there for a couple of years, and at that time when he's in jail, Pharaoh, I know we're running really quick now through the story, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, has certain dreams that he doesn't know what they mean. And someone says to Pharaoh, you know, I know this guy in jail who can interpret dreams. And Pharaoh says, well, bring him out here. So they bring Joseph out. He's 30 years old by this time. It was, he was 17 when they sold him into slavery. He's 30 years old now. And Joseph basically says, well, your dreams mean that there's going to be seven years of plenty and everything is going to be great, but then after that there's going to be seven years of famine. And so what we've got to do is we've got to gather up, store up as much food as we can in these seven years so we'll be okay for the seven years of famine. And Pharaoh is so impressed with this guy, he basically has him to lead this whole operation. And, and Joseph basically becomes the number two guy in Egypt. Kind of like the prime minister of Egypt behind Pharaoh. Now, this famine, when the famine hits, it extends, it's not only in Egypt, but it extends all the way to the land of Canaan. Where Jacob and Joseph's other brothers are. And so they say, well, you know what? There's no food to eat here, but apparently in Egypt they have food. So let's go over to Egypt and get some food. Long story short, they reunite. The entire family from Canaan moves to Egypt along with Jacob and the, the 11 brothers, their wives, everyone. They go and they live there and they're supported and taken care of by Joseph. Now, now we're getting to my point. <laughs> In chapter 50, which is the end of the story, the brother, as soon as Jacob dies, the brothers say, ooh, you know, it may have been that Joseph was only taking care of us for the sake of our father. He didn't want to like kill us all for what we did, you know, not to break the old man's heart. But now that Jacob is dead, he may grab us and kill us. I mean, that's quite understandable. And so they're a bit worried about this. Look what they say in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. So they send messengers, they don't go themselves, to Joseph, saying, saying, before your father died, he commanded, saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph, and Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Now whether, jo whether Jacob had actually said this, I don't know. Verse 18, Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. Fulfilling the dream that he had had many, many years earlier. Verse 19, Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? Notice verse 20. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about, as it is this day, to save many people alive. We have a direct parallel in the words. You can see it even more in the Hebrew. You did this for evil, but God did it for good. You meant it 
For evil, God meant it for good. What's the it? The sin that they did. Selling him into slavery. You did it for evil. He doesn't say, oh, it doesn't matter. It all worked out well in the end. No. What you did was evil. These were evil people with evil intents who did a horrible, evil act. And yet, he says, God did that same act so as to bring about many people alive today. All these people in Egypt survived. His own family survived because he was sold into slavery 20 years earlier. You know, Joseph went through a really difficult time for many, many years. And along the way, he could have said, you know, this, when he was in jail, and you know, when he was a slave, he could have said, man, this was just, this is all my brother's fault. What they did was so evil, and surely enough it was. But Joseph understood the sovereignty of God. He understood that all things happen according to his hand, according to his purpose. And God did this because he wanted to save many people. All the Egyptians and, of course, his own family. Which, of course, in turn would produce the Messiah. A millennium and a half later. No, more than that. And we see again the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man in this verse. Let me close with two big lessons. Let me close with two big lessons. Number one. Never use the sovereignty of God as an excuse to sin. Never use the sovereignty of God as an excuse to say, well, we can disobey God, because I mean, God has decreed everything anyway, so it doesn't matter. You know, I don't really have to go preach the gospel to anyone. If God is going to save them, He'll save them. I don't need to teach my children about God. If God is going to save them, He'll save them. It doesn't really matter what I do anyway. I mean, God has decreed everything anyway. Can't do that because God has commanded us to obey Him, to have faith in Him, to repent of our sins. And we are responsible to be obedient to God. So never use the sovereignty of God and the predestination of God as an excuse to sin and be disobedient. But number two, second big lesson is this. To me at least, the sovereignty of God is an extremely comforting thing to know that in all the evil that happens all day long in the world, evil in our own house, evil outside, evil in ourselves, evil in others, every, evil all over the place, in all this evil that exists in the world, God is still in control of it. God is not the one who is doing the sinning, but God is, control of, is in control of it, is sovereign over it. Sinful man, even Satan himself, can only go as far as God will allow him. Remember the book of Job. I want to, Satan says, I want to hurt Job, but you won't let me. And God says, well, you can go this far. Okay, and Satan goes this far. And he says, I want to hurt him more, but I can't. God says, okay, you can go this far. Only this far. God is the one who can control the evil that people do. To bring about a greater good. No one with their sin can thwart the plans of God. It's not that God is like, oh my goodness, look at all the sin that people are doing. You know, now I have to change my plans. No. Rather, he can use the most wicked act and bring about good. Just like with Judas. Judas performs one of the wickedest acts in the history of the world, betraying the Lord of glory, the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, in that very same act, God brings about the greatest and holiest act that has ever been performed in the history of the world, and that's Jesus Christ dying for the sins of his people. Who would have thought? The wisdom of God. Thank you for your attention. Let's pray.